Blade Runner. The all-time cult classic neo-noir futuristic philosophical movie where Harrison Ford plays Rick Deckard, a reluctant cop who was brought out of retirement to hunt down replicants. Manufactured synthetic humans after a fugitive group leave an off-world colony and head back to Los Angeles 2019. Not only must Deckard go on a brutal quest to hunt down the replicants, but also a quest of self-discovery, life, and what it means to be human himself, where he must eventually face off with the replicants' powerful group leader, Roy Batty, played by Rutger Hauer. But what further complicates the situation is Deckard also starts falling in love with Rachel, an advanced replicant played by Sean Young. In this somber but still captivating movie, which, although didn't wow everyone back in 1982 on its original release, has gone on to become considered a masterpiece and an important movie in cinema and science fiction lore in general. So today we are going to explore this classic movie by looking into 10 amazing facts about Blade Runner. Then maybe we can try to understand why upon its release no one was really interested in it. And why since then we just can't seem to get enough of it. So, let's check it out. Wake up. Time to die. <laughs> Number 10, based on a Philip K. Dick novel. Just as with movies like Total Recall and Minority Report, Blade Runner is in fact based off the works of acclaimed science fiction writer Philip K. Dick. To be precise, his novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? The 1968 novel is set in post-apocalyptic San Francisco, where the world is heavily polluted by radiation after a catastrophic nuclear global war, with many life forms on Earth now being extinct. Where just like the movie that succeeds it, the focus is put on Deckard who must head out and kill, or rather retire, a group of rogue androids. Like the movie, the book tackles humanity and the construct of empathy. But there are also many, many other differences between book and movie, to the point where it's claimed that the movie is more inspired by the book. And in an ironic twist, do androids dream of Electric Sheep's author Philip K. Dick died just over a month before the release of Blade Runner, so it's a shame he never got to see how big his legacy has become. Number 9. The Journey to Blade Runner Ever since the release of Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, there have been an interest to develop it onto the big screen, with several filmmakers attached to developing it into a movie. But the plans either never fell through, or Philip K. Dick himself didn't like the scripts or the direction the movie was going in. One director who was interested in the novel was Martin Scorsese, but of course nothing came of it. American scriptwriter Hampton Fancher wrote a screenplay in 1977 for what would eventually become Blade Runner, and Deer Hunter producer Michael Dealey brought the script, and Alan Ladd's company, the appropriately named The Ladd Company, agreed to produce the movie, which is where the project really started to take off. At the time, director Ridley Scott had impressed the world of cinema with his haunting horror science fiction masterpiece, Alien, and so he was offered the chance to direct the movie, but turned it down. Instead, he chose to direct the movie, Dune, but due to that movie's constant issues and delays, he left the project to work on the cinematic version of Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep instead. Number 8. Blade Runner got its title from yet another book. Although it's well known that Blade Runner is at least somewhat inspired by the Philip K. Dick novel Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, what people may not know is that it took inspiration from another book titled The Blade Runner. Okay, let me explain. When Ridley Scott joined the project, he wasn't entirely happy with the script, namely the script focusing more on environmental issues rather than humanity themes. The movie scriptwriter Hanton Fancher came across a script written by William S. Burroughs called Blade Runner, a movie, 
which was a script based off a 1974 novel called The Blade Runner, which like Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep is a story about a dystopian world where medical treatment is free as long as patients are qualified for it, with the story focusing on a black market doctor. Both Fancher and Scott fell in love with the name Blade Runner and wanted to use it for a title for their movie, but in order to do so they had to purchase the rights of the script. Yep, another script was bought just to use the title. And before Blade Runner was chosen as the movie's title, other titles were suggested, including Android and Dangerous Days. Yeah, I think Blade Runner is definitely the better title. Number 7. The Hunt for Deckard Scriptwriter Hanton Fancher's favourite choice for playing the lead role of Deckard was Robert Mitchum, who at the time was 65 years of age. In fact, Fancher had Mitchum in mind while writing the script. However, the actor the producers seemed to really want was Dustin Hoffman, and several meetings between Hoffman and the producers and Ridley Scott was held, but nothing came of the meetings. There were other big names thrown around, including Jack Nicholson, Gene Hackman, Sean Connery, Burt Reynolds, Al Pacino and Tommy Lee Jones. However, Harrison Ford was chosen thanks to starring in Star Wars and Raiders of the Lost Ark, two movies that were hugely successful at the time. Ford was interested in the script because he felt that the part of Deckard would explore new avenues in his acting ability in playing a complicated character with depth and turmoil. Number 6. Fights with Scott Although Blade Runner is arguably one of Harrison Ford's finest performances, in which he perfectly captures Deckard's humanity with grace and dignity, it's a well-known fact that he and Ridley Scott didn't exactly see eye to eye throughout Blade Runner's shoot, and often clashed. The biggest catalyst for Ford's and Scott's downfall of working together was mainly creative differences, as Scott wanted Blade Runner to feature ambiguity over if Deckard himself is a replicant, whereas Ford felt that the character was purely human, and depicting him as otherwise would take away from the character's humanity. Also, in later days of Blade Runner's shoot, Harrison Ford was no longer available for filming, so there are actually several shots of the Deckard character where we can't see his face, where the part was in fact performed by stuntman Vic Armstrong, who was a regular on the Bond films and also Ford's stuntman for the Indiana Jones movie. Although, there are supposedly some blink and you'll miss it shots where you can actually see Vic Armstrong's face. And the bathroom scene where Deckard finds the snake scales was apparently filmed without any involvement with Harrison Ford whatsoever. Number 5. Shining Footage The original cut of Blade Runner ends with a rather happy and uplifting ending where Deckard and Rachel leave the dark and polluted city of Los Angeles and drive away into a wilderness setting to presumably live happily ever after, giving the movie's end a warm, happy glow. However, if you think these shots look familiar, that is because the aerial footage of Deckard and Rachel driving off into the mountains was actually footage originally filmed for The Shining. Yep, outtakes that were intended for the opening of The Shining, from when Jack was driving to the Overlook Hotel. Apparently, the ending had to be quickly put together, and Stanley Kubrick was asked if some of his unused archive footage from The Shining, which came out two years earlier, could be used to which he agreed. Although the first time I saw the movie, I didn't think the end footage of the mountains matched the constantly dark and terrifying world that we had previously seen throughout the movie. But oh well, it is what it is. So who would have thought that The Shining's terrifying intro could also act as Blade Runner's more heartfelt outro? <laughs> Weird, huh? Number 4. Adding the Narration The original cut of Blade Runner features a voiceover narration dialogue by Harrison Ford as the Deckard character, basically acting as an inner monologue explaining the story and how he's feeling. Originally, the movie wasn't intended to feature a voiceover, but was only done due to Blade Runner's test screening, which apparently was disastrous. And a huge complaint associated with the film was the fact that the audience just had no idea what was going on and found the whole movie to be confusing. So it was decided to add the narration, to fill the audience in with what's going on and to explain certain situations and scenarios, a sort of way of keeping the audience up to speed. Some people hate the narration, whereas others feel like it adds to the movie's noir feel. 
One person who wasn't a fan of the narration was Harrison Ford himself, who called the experience of having to go back and record the narration as a nightmare. But regardless, he was contracted to provide the narration. There are rumours that he deliberately provided a poor narration out of frustration, but Ford claims that he did the best that he could, but it was just a bad narration in general that wasn't written the best. Number 3. Comic Book Yeah, believe it or not, but Blade Runner actually had a comic book adaptation released to coincide with the movie. Despite the fact the comic actually came out before the movie, revealing many spoilers about the film. But hey, it was 1982. These days, if something like that happened, people would flip out. What with its slow pace and spiritual focus over action, Blade Runner may not seem like comic book material, but Marvel Comics still went through and brought Blade Runner into the comic book panel domain. After all, they had previously done it with Harrison Ford's previous big movies, including Star Wars and Raiders of the Lost Ark. And although Blade Runner makes for a kind of lackluster comic, one thing that can't be denied is just how beautifully it's illustrated. Much of the scenery and character likenesses are totally spot on with how they are seen in the film. Even this image of Deckard hanging off the ledge with Roy Beatty's hand grabbing him round the wrist is very powerful and striking and almost a masterpiece in its own right. So although Blade Runner story-wise might not be the best comic book experience, it's still a very visually pleasing one. Number 2. Blade Runner Cinematic Universe Although cinematic universes may seem like a modern phenomenon, what with the likes of Marvel and DC, apparently Blade Runner was already part of its own shared universe. We are now familiar with the Blade Runner sequel, Blade Runner 2049, which came out in 2017. However, Blade Runner already had something of a sequel, with the 1998 futuristic science fiction movie Soldier, starring Kurt Russell, about a rogue soldier resisting his commands, to which a genetically enhanced soldier tries to hunt him down. The script was written by Blade Runner's co-writer, David Peoples, who describes Soldier to be a spiritual sequel spin-off to Blade Runner, and one of the spinner flying cars from Blade Runner can be seen in a junkyard in Soldier. But more to the point, Ridley Scott has also expressed that Blade Runner takes place in the same universe as his previous movie, Alien, of which I can actually see that the world that the space miners in Aliens come from is the world of Blade Runner, and both movies have a dark, gritty, and thought-provoking tone. But this is where things get really interesting, as Alien also exists in the Predator universe, which, as I've discussed in previous episodes, also has a shared universe with Die Hard and Commando. Okay, okay, the more research you do into this apparent shared universe, the bigger and weirder it becomes. Number one, there are seven versions of Blade Runner. Although Blade Runner had a promising start when it was first released, its numbers in the box office slowly dropped, and it only made $33.9 million on a $28 million budget. It's believed its biggest downfall was competing against other big movies that came out at the time, namely Steven Spielberg's E.T. the Extraterrestrial. Also, critics weren't too kind either, as I think people were expecting a big, action-packed science fiction spectacle like Star Wars, but got a more heartfelt, thought-provoking tale instead. One critic even referred to the movie as Blade Crawler. So ever since its release, there have been several different versions produced, such as a US cut, theatrical cut, international cut, and so on. There are seven versions of Blade Runner in total. The most well-known alternative cut is the director's cut, which came out in 1992, which removed Deckard's narration along with the happy mountainside ending, and leaned more to the idea that Deckard himself is a replicant. Finally, in 2007, a final cut was released, which put Ridley Scott in charge with it being solely his vision of Blade Runner. I have found Blade Runner to be a movie that actually gets better the older I get. I think when I was a kid, I was expecting a big explosive action movie. Whereas in reality, it's a movie that dives into themes of humanity and what it means to be human. Themes that I couldn't really appreciate as a kid, but actually do as an adult. So watch Blade Runner with an open mind. View it more as an experience than a spectacle. 
Blade Runner was probably a bit too clever and insightful for its own good when it was originally released, but like all great masterpieces, its true genius has been realised in time. Anyway, I'm Minty, and this is my inner dialogue narration saying, see ya!